For decades, Yellowstone has been seen as the safest place in the United States for people to get close to an active geothermal system. Millions of families believed the risks were under control, that there were places in this country that would always remain stable, no matter what happened elsewhere. But aerial images are beginning to challenge that belief. There is no volcanic eruption, no immediate disaster. What appears instead are unusual gaps, familiar areas placed behind barriers, tour routes quietly adjusted, and a national park operating in ways most visitors were never prepared for. Yellowstone is still open, but the unsettling question is why it has had to change how it stays open. What is happening beneath the surface that forces a national symbol to slow down? And who is truly bearing the cost of these adjustments? What the drones capture is only the surface layer. What lies beneath is what makes this story impossible to ignore. One, what suddenly changed inside Yellowstone's most familiar areas. The images recorded after the event do not show the catastrophe many feared. There are no massive plumes of smoke, no lava, no scenes of chaos requiring evacuations. Yet it is what does not appear in those images that has begun to worry people. Yellowstone is no longer operating as it once did. Some areas have been quietly removed from public access. Familiar routes disappear from maps without loud announcements or explanations meant to alarm anyone not because a supervolcano has awakened, but because a system long considered stable has begun to reveal weaknesses that are difficult to control. On the surface, Yellowstone still seems the same. Geysers continue to erupt on familiar schedules. Steam rises each morning as sunlight touches the valleys. There are no emergency banners running across national television screens. At a quick glance, everything looks nearly normal. But if you have ever visited Yellowstone, you know this place rarely stands still. It is always moving always crowded, always filled with footsteps, voices, and steady streams of visitors. And after what has just happened, in some locations, that movement has vanished. Wooden walkways that once welcomed thousands of footsteps each day are now blocked by temporary fencing. Some familiar boardwalk sections end abruptly, no longer leading to the stops visitors expect. Directional signs still stand, but their arrows no longer point toward places that once defined the experience. Yellowstone has not collapsed, it has been interrupted. This interruption is not dramatic, and it does not produce shocking images, but it is serious enough to force park managers to close off portions of space long considered safe and familiar. In an ordinary national park, that might be a routine administrative decision. In Yellowstone, it signals something else, that a long-held sense of normal has begun to lose its stability. Because Yellowstone is not a static preserve, it is a living system, and in a system like that, change rarely stays confined to one place. Visitors arriving in the days after the event may not notice right away. They still take photos, still wait by the geysers, still follow the routes that remain open. But the experience is different. Paths are shorter. Familiar stops are no longer part of the schedule. Gaps begin to appear where attention once gathered. In a park designed to absorb millions of visitors each year and spread them across many areas. Gaps like these are never small matters. When one link is cut, pressure does not disappear. It shifts elsewhere. A closed route makes another more crowded. A quieter zone places greater strain on another. Small adjustments on a map can trigger a chain of changes most visitors never see. That is why these temporary fences are more than safety measures. They are signs that Yellowstone is being forced to adjust itself, not because a disaster has already happened, but because the risk of instability has become too clear to ignore. All of this is happening quietly. No major press conferences. No nationwide warning messages. Just small changes, unfolding step by step. Enough for those familiar with Yellowstone to sense that things are no longer what they were. And this is only the first layer of consequence. Because what is unfolding on the surface of the park is merely the most visible part of a much more complex story. A story that did not begin today. And certainly does not end at these barricades. 2. Why parts of Yellowstone went quiet without warning. Yellowstone is rarely quiet and when it is. That has almost never been a good sign. After the recent event, what caught many people's attention was not what happened, but what disappeared. In certain areas, there were no longer crowds filling the walkways, no longer groups lingering at places once considered the heart of the experience. Yellowstone remains open, but in a very different way. And that difference is not emotional, it is operational. According to the National Park Service, Yellowstone is not managed as a fixed space, routes, stops, 
and visitor flow are constantly adjusted based on real-world risk assessments in each area. When part of the geothermal system becomes less stable than usual, localized closures are not meant to cause alarm. But to prevent risk from building up in places with high visitor density, this explains why. After the event, visitors were not barred from entering Yellowstone, but were limited in how they experienced it. Not because the park as a whole became more dangerous, but because certain specific areas were no longer suitable for maintaining the same level of foot traffic as before, Yellowstone has long operated on movement. Even early in the morning, when parking lots are still sparse, there are always footsteps. Quiet conversations, small groups waiting for a familiar geyser. The flow of people is the rhythm of the park, and when one beat is held back, the entire system must adjust to avoid putting pressure on sensitive points. Once familiar routes were removed from the journey, pressure did not disappear. It shifted. Areas that remained open grew more crowded, not because Yellowstone became more attractive, but because visitor choices became narrower. Park managers had anticipated this. In a geothermal system where risk is unevenly distributed, crowding can increase exposure in places that require wider safety buffers. That is why the silence in certain areas is not a sign that Yellowstone has slowed down. It is the result of a deliberate decision to spread risk. Temporary fencing and warning signs are not just barriers to access, but tools to rebalance human movement within a system that never stands still. What stands out is that all of this happened without major warning messages. No emergency declarations. No strong language across national media. Just brief updates, enough to show these were technical adjustments, not panic-driven reactions. For most visitors, the change felt like a mild inconvenience. But behind the scenes, it reflects an unusual condition being closely monitored. Yellowstone has partially closed areas in the past due to flooding, wildfires, and minor geological shifts. What makes this moment different is that the adjustments are occurring in places long seen as the most stable and familiar. When areas like these are forced into silence, it is no longer about visitor perception. It is a signal that the operational safety threshold has changed. To most visitors, Yellowstone simply feels quieter in a few corners. But for those responsible for keeping the park operating safely each day, that quiet carries a very specific meaning. It shows the system is being held back. Not because something terrible has already happened, but because the risk of instability has become too clear to ignore. And when a national symbol is forced to adjust its own rhythm, the effects of that decision do not stop at the park's boundaries. 3. The real cost paid outside Yellowstone's park boundaries. When people talk about the changes unfolding at Yellowstone, very few images capture what is most directly affected. Not the geysers, not the closed walkways, but the people living beyond the park's borders. They do not appear in aerial footage, yet they are the ones who feel every shift in Yellowstone's operating rhythm most clearly. In gateway towns like West Yellowstone and Gardner, the tourist season is not an abstract idea. It determines income for the entire year. Small hotels, souvenir shops, family-run tours, and seasonal workers all operate by the same logic. When visitor flow moves smoothly from the park into town, everything functions. When that flow is disrupted, even partially, the impact appears quickly. After some areas inside Yellowstone were closed, there was no panic in these towns, no protests, no public statements of opposition. But small changes began to surface in daily life, shorter stays, tours canceled or adjusted, familiar stops removed from itineraries, reducing the amount of time visitors spent in town. For travelers, this may feel like a minor inconvenience, an experience that feels incomplete. But for those who depend on each parked car, each overnight stay, each meal sold, those changes add up to very real pressure. What matters is that most of the people affected have no direct voice in the park's operational decisions. They do not participate in geological risk assessments. They do not decide which areas close or reopen. Yet their livelihoods are tied closely to every technical adjustment made inside Yellowstone. Many seasonal workers come here for only a few months each year. Their income is concentrated in a short window. When routes are shortened, visitors spread out or leave earlier than expected. They are the first to feel the impact. Not through statistics, but through fewer tips, reduced shifts, or unstable schedules. Small businesses face the same reality. Yellowstone has not shut down completely, but when parts of the experience disappear, visitor expectations shift. A trip that ends sooner than planned leads to less spending, and in towns where the economy depends almost entirely on tourism, such adjustments are rarely small matters. This creates a familiar paradox in nature-based tourism systems. Decisions made to reduce risk and ensure safety inside the park can shift the burden outward. 
onto communities with limited ability to adapt. No one argues that closures are wrong. Safety must come first. But questions arise when these adjustments are no longer rare exceptions and begin to look like part of a new operating norm. At that point, uncertainty no longer exists only underground or on the geothermal surface. It spreads into the economic lives of surrounding communities. In the images recorded after the event, there are no scenes of shuttered shops or deserted towns. But change does not always appear clearly. It exists in the gaps between peak seasons, in fewer workdays than expected, and in the quiet waiting for the next adjustment and where it will land. Yellowstone remains one of America's top destinations, but for those who live beside it, each operational adjustment is a reminder that the stability they depend on does not come from nature itself, but from how people choose to live alongside it. And from here, the story moves toward a more difficult question. Not only what is happening inside Yellowstone, but why a relatively small disruption can set off such a long chain of consequences. 4. How a small incident triggered a much bigger shift. By this point, one question becomes clear. If there was no major disaster, no volcanic eruption, no nationwide emergency warning, why was a relatively small incident enough to change how Yellowstone operates and set off a chain of effects beyond the park itself? The answer lies in the nature of Yellowstone. This is not a park where nature has been fully stabilized for tourism. Yellowstone is an active geothermal system, and visitors are allowed to come very close to it. That access has always involved a trade-off. Any small change on the surface is evaluated in terms of accumulated risk, not just at one location, but across the entire operating system. In geothermal areas, the idea of something being small does not carry its usual meaning. A geographically limited incident can force a restructuring of how visitor flow is distributed, not because danger is spreading immediately, but because underlying safety assumptions have been unsettled. Yellowstone is run on the assumption that familiar routes can absorb steady numbers of visitors over long periods. When one route is no longer suitable for public access, the pressure does not vanish. It shifts to the areas that remain open, increasing density in places that were already sensitive. That is why partial closures are not responses to what has already happened, but measures meant to prevent secondary risks that could emerge if the system continued to operate as before. In an environment where risk is uneven, managing human movement becomes the most important safety tool. What stands out is that these decisions rarely come from panic. They are built on accumulated experience, on past incidents, and on clearly defined limits of how close people can safely be brought to an active natural system. And here is where the larger paradox appears. The more successfully Yellowstone has been open to the public, the more sensitive it becomes to disturbances that once carried little meaning. A small incident, in this context, can produce effects far greater than the incident itself. At this point, the question is no longer why Yellowstone reacts strongly. It is how long Yellowstone can continue operating under its current model. 5. What science can and cannot predict here. Yellowstone is often viewed in extremes, Either it is completely safe, or it is moving toward a major disaster. The scientific reality lies between those two views. Yellowstone is not a ticking bomb. It is a vast geothermal system, constantly active, with thousands of geysers and hot springs. Most of the time, the system adjusts itself without leaving clear signals on the surface. That is what creates the sense of stability many people are familiar with. But a sense of stability is not the same as perfect predictability. Scientists can monitor large-scale movements within the system, they measure small earthquakes, track ground uplift and subsidence, and analyze thermal and chemical trends in key areas. These data are enough to confirm that Yellowstone shows no signs of a large-scale event when it comes to localized hydrothermal incidents. However, predictability has limits. These changes often happen quickly, within small areas, and do not always leave signals strong enough to be detected in advance. This is not because science is flawed, but because the system itself does not follow simple warning thresholds. That is why scientists rarely make predictions tied to specific days or times. Instead, they speak in terms of probability and risk levels. When absolute stability cannot be guaranteed everywhere, the safest option is to reduce human presence in sensitive areas. This does not mean Yellowstone is becoming more dangerous. It means the limits of prediction are being recognized more clearly. And once those limits are acknowledged, cautious operation is no longer optional. It becomes necessary. From this uncertainty, Management decisions are made, and every decision carries very real consequences for visitor experience and for life around the park. What science reveals at Yellowstone is not absolute certainty, but the boundaries of what can be predicted. Safety here is not a fixed condition. 
It is an ongoing process of adjustment between new data and management choices. When uncertainty cannot be eliminated, the only remaining option is to reduce risk by controlling how closely people approach an active geothermal system. That is also the point where the story needs to close with a larger question. 6. When a national icon is forced to rethink safety, Yellowstone is still there. The geysers still erupt. The familiar roads still exist. From a distance, nothing may appear dramatic enough to cause alarm. There are no red warnings on maps. No emergency messages broadcast nationwide. No signs of a looming catastrophe. Yet it is that sense of normalcy that has led many people to pause and think. Because what has happened shows that Yellowstone is no longer operating on old momentum. It is being managed more tightly, more cautiously, with less room for error. And each time the system adjusts itself, the cost is not confined to the park. It spreads to the communities that depend on its stability. No one can say the recent decisions were wrong. Safety must always come first but it is also impossible to deny that a model allowing millions of people to approach an active natural system up close has always been more fragile than it appears. Yellowstone was once seen as a place where people could stand close to nature while believing everything was under control. What is unfolding suggests that belief needs to be reconsidered, not because danger is rising suddenly, but because the limits of control are becoming clearer. In a place like this, not every question has an immediate answer. Science can observe, management can adjust, but absolute certainty has never been something that could be promised. And each small step back in public access signals that the line between exploration and safety is being redrawn. The story, then, does not end with what happened at Yellowstone. It reaches toward a broader issue. As we continue to move closer to complex natural systems, how much uncertainty are we willing to accept as part of that experience? For Yellowstone, the recent adjustments may be temporary, or they may signal that a new operating model is taking shape one that is less exposed, less absolute in its assurances, and one that asks people to accept that not every national symbol can maintain the feeling of complete safety forever. In the end, the most important question is not whether Yellowstone is safe, it is how we choose to define that safety. Once we better understand the limits that neither science nor management can overcome, and that question remains open, not only for Yellowstone, but for every place where people choose to live alongside natural systems that have never stood still, Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.